Oh, we're still in that area. We are vanishing free. So the here is still active and present. The next is one of the things of spheres. He's still around, but that is not as long as either. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Scotland, so the land tour. This is a lot less noise there. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I was at a conference where Judy went on the here, but certainly not to see you at the Loch Ness. Anything around your bucket list that you haven't heard of? Yeah, I think it's a lot of those. Yeah, I think it's a lot of those. That's what Captain talked about. Yeah. I most of that, but they were not least that. They were not We lived in South Africa for three months and built. Wow. We can hear you. Definitely no, hear you. Yeah. Louder. <laughs> All right. Can, how is is the audio okay? Your technical. I think they were just further back in the classroom. So I'm just going to turn you down a little bit. Uh, this is one of those. Yeah. Uh, can you say something again, then? Okay, that's better for us. They want to have something snacks here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where's the snack? Oh well, he's yeah. Yeah, there's snack. <laughs> Is there something afterwards? I I think it should. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, you know, ask them. Not, uh, are you guys going to join for dinner? Well, he's yeah. He's a pre schedule. I'm pre schedule. Uh, I didn't have anything to do. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Robert Stern at the University of Texas at Dallas. Today, we want to talk about a way to organize videos to foster students' Earth system thinking. Earth system thinking reflects an advanced mental model of understanding how. And we are working with Professor Robert Stern at the University of Texas at Dallas. Today, we want to talk about a way to organize videos to foster students' Earth system thinking. Earth system thinking reflects an advanced mental model of understanding how Earth works. Advancing the understanding of Earth system is currently a core focus of both standards and outcomes for Jusan teaching and learning, and preparation for the next generation Jusan work. To help learners, here we propose a new model that aims to foster learners' understanding of Earth systems with a special structure and organize Jusan educational videos under Google Earth like interactive virtual Earth environment. The proposed Jusan video library model will give learners and teachers the ability to see and compare both the complex systems and single components. The fundamental unit of the system is observable objects or events. Because observable events, such as earthquakes or objects, such as rocks, are more intuitive for and familiar by and relevant to people. Moreover, there are many videos available online that can now be directly related to places. They are now directly about these observable elements of objects, and there are more about abstract concepts or high-level knowledge of JSON. We name these videos non-place-based videos. In this JSON video library model, we use these non-place-based videos to support the learning of the place-based videos. 
Applying the video library model, we created our own Google Earth Geoscience video library, or for short, Gagful. Here we give two examples on how to use Gagful to teach Earth science in class. For example, focusing on the Hungatonga volcano eruption in January 2022, Gagful allows one to easily put this single event into context of the regional systems, including past events, their systematic reasons, as well as how this single event impacts the overall Earth system through time. Gagful is also a really great asset for preparing Texas middle school students for the earth science part of their state standard test STAR. Teachers can easily project some of the past questions to the Google Earth environment and pick relevant videos that they want to show students, either from Gekvul or from other sources. We invite contributions to Gekvul from all geoscientists and would greatly appreciate your help in furthering the development of Gekvul by reviewing videos or by even utilizing Gekvul in your team. Worry about time. Is that talk of that? Yeah, so my class starts at 5 oh, okay. okay. I have a lot of slides in the classroom. Just do that. So they will get a name. Also, I'll give up the Longtime friend of mine, Brian Cardot. Brian received degrees from University of Illinois at Champaign Urbana and from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. They are, were two of the top uh, universities back in the day uh, for coal science, for organic photography. And uh, Brian, after he graduated, uh, got a job with the Illinois, uh, the uh, Oklahoma State uh, Geological Survey, where for 40 years he's been very productive applying organic photography to a wide range of, of issues that uh, you can see listed in the description of his uh, course. Well, uh, I, I feel I've known Brian for my whole life, whole professional life. So I tried to remember where we first came in contact, where we first met. And I rummaged through my office and uh, one of the first things that came across is a classic, or first of all, uh, prestigious Oklahoma ge geology notes, which I'm sure you all get uh, regularly. Um, there it is. A, an article that we jointly authored on trace element content of Hi. solid hydrocarbons from Oklahoma. A classic article it should be mandatory for all geoscientists. But while I was digging through a pile of crap in my room, I came across this. And uh, Brian doesn't know what this is. But that was, so this was August of. 93. So we've known each other obviously for about 30 years. Well, this is a TSOP newsletter, Society for Organic Petrology, and uh, September 1996. And Brian, on page three is the president's letter authored by one Brian J. Cardock. On page eight of this Newsletter is an article by Brian Cardot and others. But sandwiched between or those two articles by Brian Cardot is an article by Finkelman. And in this article, I acknowledge a mistake that I made in the previous article. And now forever, Brian is going to be a reminder of the one mistake that I made in a career of almost 60 years. So every time I see him now, <laughs> I'm going to think of this. It, it, well, to be honest, it was the one mistake that I acknowledged. So, nevertheless, despite 
Brian reminded me of my one era. It's a pleasure to introduce my friend, Brian Cardot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Bob talked about the Society for Organic Petrology, TSOP, and I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, the TSOP was founded in 1984, so I'm a founding member of TSOP, one of the, the few remaining founding members. And then I hosted the annual meeting in 1993 and was TSOP president, 95 to 96. So uh, going a long way back to TSOP. Well, so as an organic metrologist, so I was an organic metrologist at the Oakland Metrological Service for 40 years. And as an organic metrologist, there's three things that we want to know for hydrocarbon source rocks. One is the amount of organic matter, the type of organic matter, whether it was oil generative or gas generative, and then thermal maturity. How hot did the rock get? And how we now in the oil window, condensate window, dry gas window. So uh, this was applied originally to hydrocarbon source rocks and then more recently to these shale reservoirs, uh, gas shales and tight oil plays. So I want to point out, first of all, that in the lower right hand corner, of all my slides are a number, a sequential number. So if you have any questions, if you have time at the end for questions, uh, if you want to come back to a certain slide, that's how you'll find it. This presentation started out as a, uh, a lecture in Dr. Paul Phillips' petroleum geochemistry class, explaining what vitronite reflectance is, and um, where his students would use the numbers, but they had no idea of where they came from. So um, we, the, the goals of the presentation are to answer these questions. What are vitronite and bitumen? And as we'll see, bitumen reflectance is, is as important as vitronite reflectance, and I'll show why. And then what are vitronite bitumen reflectance? How are they measured? What are some sources of error? And how do you tell good data from bad data? And, and really, that's going to be the key, hopefully, takeaway. In the future, if you ever use vitronite reflectance data to know, is this good data or bad data? And how would I know? So I start out with dispersed organic matter in shale in an immature shale. And there's an important reason why I'm going with the immature rather than more mature, high, higher thermal maturity shale. So uh, in a shale, most of the rock is going to be mineral matter, and a small percentage is going to be the organic matter. Of that organic matter, most of it in, in an immature shale will be kerogen, defined as the insoluble organic matter. And then a smaller percentage would be the bitumen. And by definition, uh, is the soluble organic matter, but there are also pyrobitumens, which are insoluble. So the term bitumen uh, is, is uh, difficult. Well, the organic matter doesn't change, but the way we look at it will change depending on, uh, uh, on how it's looked at. So for example, palynologists over here look at organic matter in strew slides, basically thin sections in transmitted light, and they have their own classification. Petroleum geochemists uh, burn the rock and end up uh, with a bulk analysis, which will tell you what's the predominant type of organic matter, types one, two, three, uh, four kerogen. But I'll be using the cold petrologist terminology for the mass role group. And these are the mass role groups, uh, liptonite, vitronite, and inertinite. So the word mass role uh, came from Reese Stokes in 1935 from the Latin word macerare, which means to soften. Bill Spackman in 1958 indicated that mass rolls are organic substances or optically homogeneous aggregates of organic substances possessing distinctive physical and chemical properties and occurring naturally in rocks. And the thing I want to emphasize here is that they're organic, much like the word mineral is for inorganics. Well, we use the word mass roll for organics, but it's also optically homogeneous. You can't identify uh, these mass rolls in a hand sample. We, and you'll see why. They're all intertwined in, in various uh, microscopic sizes. So this is the uh, mass roll classification. Um, notice that all of the mass rolls end in inite. So we've got vitronite, liptonite, inertinite. Vitronite, <coughs> the, the origin of vitronite is that it's a cell wall material or woody tissue of plants. And in reflected white light, it has an intermediate reflectance between the other two. The liptonite mass rolls are derived from the waxy resinous parts of plants like the spores, cuticles, and resin, and they have the lowest reflectance in reflected white light. 
The inert night minerals are plant materials strongly altered and degraded in the peat stage of coal formation, and they have the highest recyclants. While vitronite and shale was formed from wood, the vascular tissues of xylem and phloem deposited in a lake or marine environment. Any alteration of the wood through due to oxidation or charring will, a prior to deposition will result in the inert dimasterol. So many of the inert dimasterols started out as the same woody organic matter, but through oxidation, say uh, in a swamp where the trees were above the water table, they would degrade with microbes and uh, oxygen, and uh, that would create these uh, semi-inerts. And then the inerts, you can think of a swamp fire that comes through, a lightning strike, and you have this, anything above the water table will char. Well, that's what these inert night um, masterals are. Well, vitronite occurs in post-Silurian age rocks. So anything older won't have vitronite in it, but there's vitronite-like organic matter in Ordovician age rocks. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. The point of this slide is to, to show you that there isn't just one vitronite. There are many different types of vitronite with different terms depending on, let's see, I pushed the wrong. Depending on whether it was uh, the 1982 classification or the 1994. So we have all these different names. We can identify these vitronite types in a coal, but not in shale. In shale, we're looking at just the little fragments of vitronite. And then down here it shows this is the classification of coal masterols. Again, there are many different masterols. Uh, uh, vitronite, many different types of masterols, the liptonite masterols, the inertite masterols. So again, in a, say, a coal petrology course, it would take a whole semester to go through and identify all these. I just wanted to point out that there are you know, many different types of masterols within these masteral groups. And then this is the classification for primary dispersed organic matter in uh, shales. So in addition to these masterols that we had in coal, we have additional ones that we don't see in coal. So for example, amorph amorphous organic matter. Well, amorphous organic matter is what we can't identify to its source. And it turns out that most of the organic matter in a shale, 70, 80% is this amorphous organic matter. Next uh, type is alginite. We have some um, lacustrine algae that you might find in a coal, but we don't see these marine algaes that, you, that are predominant in a marine shale. And then zooclasts, like graptolites and titanosomes. And then finally bitumen, which is going to be a, a large part of this presentation. Well, before we can look at it under the microscope, we have to prepare the sample. With a coal sample, which is organic rich, we need maybe 30 grams of sample. For a shale, it depends on if it's organic rich or organic lean. It depends on whether we're going to make what's called a whole rock preparation or a kerogen concentrate. The kerogen concentrate essentially digests the mineral matter with hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid, and you just concentrate the organic matter. The problem is, especially for the bitumens, we want to see what the, that organic matter looked like in the rock, because the bitumens often fill up void spaces and help us identify it. So my whole career, I've used whole rock, and I'll show you what that looks like. So these are the types of pellets that we make. This is a crushed particle pellet of coal. Well, we crush it to uh, 0 0.8 millimeters, uh, mix it with epoxy, and uh, it forms into a, a mold, and, and that has to harden up overnight. This is a whole rock pellet of shale, where the cuttings, or whole rock uh, core chips, are then crushed to about one millimeter in size, mixed with an epoxy in this mold, and then uh, polished. This is a keratin concentrate where we take the dry keratin uh, and put it into, uh, mix it with epoxy and, and uh, make this pellet. And then finally, this is a, a glass standard. There's six different glasses. Each glass is, has different refractive index and we use that to calibrate the microscope. So it's a three-day process. First, we make the pellets. On one day, it has to harden overnight. The second day, we can polish it, and then that has to stay in a desiccator overnight to take any moisture out, because the moisture in, in the micropore spaces, or the pore spaces of the, the pellet, would dilute the emergent oil and change the refractive index, which messes up our calibration. So it's a three-day process. <clears throat> well, this is what coal looks like in transmitted light. The vitronite is the red, brown mass. The liptonite macerals are yellow. The inertite macerals are opaque or uh, black, 
and then this is the mineral pyrite. Well, you can tell this, uh, not only is it a true art form to make a thin section of pole, which has to be about 15 microns thick, all the way across the whole slide, but also it only tells us the composition of what, what this is in this little thin section. We don't know what the composition is anywhere else. So the, uh, the profession has used uh, these particle pellets, which gives us the whole composition of the entire thickness of a pole. In this case, the black down here is the epoxy binder. This is a uh, fragment of pole. The vitronite is the ground mass material. So again, this is a photomicrograph at 500 times magnification. So left to right, the field width is 140 microns. So we're talking a small area here. Um, and these other mass rolls, the liptonite uh, mass rolls, uh, the spores here are dark, have a low reflectance, and the inertite mass rolls have the high, high reflectance. So vitro reflectance is used to determine coal rank and thermal maturity or shales. And rank refers to the physical and chemical changes to, that occur to organic matter as it is affected by increasing temperature and time. So we have the coal rank series, starting out with the sedimentary deposit peat. We go into the rank series lignite, subituminous, bituminous, and anthracite. Now we can determine the coal rank from what's known as the proximate analysis, where we measure the moisture, the volatile matter, the mineral matter is, is called ash, where we burn it, and then we determine fixed carbon by difference. So increasing rank from left to right, we have the lignite to the anthracite rank. In low rank coals, we have a lot of moisture, a lot of water tied up with it. So uh, moisture content decreases with increasing rank. Volatile matter decreases through the bituminous rank coals. So we have the high volatile, medium volatile, and low volatile bituminous rank coals. And then fixed carbon content uh, increases with increasing rank. So vitronite reflectance in percent R sub O is a measurement of the percentage of light reflected off the vitronite mass roll at 400, 700 times magnification in oil immersion. Reflectance changes systematically with increasing thermal maturity due to increasing urbanization, condensation, and the preferred arrangement of vitronite molecular structure. So the, uh, the sub O here is for oil immersion. Well, Cotter in 1960 determined this relationship between volatile matter and maximum vitronite reflectance. So with increasing, with decreasing volatile matter content and increasing coal rank, we see this nice clean relationship to uh, increasing vitronite reflectance. Well, shown here is the maximum reflectance, R sub O max. And maximum reflectance refers to uh, where we rotate the stage 360 degrees to measure the maximum value. And as we'll see in the next few slides, uh, it's important to measure maximum reflectance once we get above 1% um, due to a pressure-induced anisotropy. Well, this slide is a, is a complicated slide. It shows reflectance of all the mass rolls on the y-axis and volatile matter content on the x-axis. A vertical line through this illustration would be any given rank of coal. So if we start with, uh, say, uh, if I were to take wood uh, from a tree out here and measure its reflectance under the microscope, it would have a reflectance around 0.2%. In lignite and subituminous rank coals, we refer to that woody organic matter as humanite. Somewhere around 04 and 0.6% reflectance, it goes through a geochemical gelification which then converts that into vitronite now. So now this is the vitronite qualification curve. Around 0.8 to 1% vitronite reflectance, we now have a uh, bifurcation of that curve, where now we have a maximum reflectance and minimum reflectance due to pressure-induced anisotropy, where low pressure, as we bury it, uh, and we'll sh I'll show you, explain that in a few minutes too. The liptonite astros have a lower reflectance and they, its reflectance gets closer and closer to that of the vitronite. And then around 1.3%, uh, which is the end of the oil window, the liptonite mass rolls, which are hydrogen rich and the source of oil, um, join the vitronite qualification curve and we can no longer identify these liptonite mass rolls. Also on this curve are the inertite mass rolls. This line represents the semi-inerts, which have a higher reflectance than vitronite, uh, but they were uh, the woody organic matter was oxidized in the peat swamp. And so its high reflectance is not related to thermal maturity. 
And then on top of here are the inert night nacelles, which were charred in this peat smoke. And then we can identify these under the microscope. <clears throat> so this shows the molecular changes of vitronite um, going from high volatile uh, bituminous rank to anthracite. And we can see at high volatile bituminous rank, we have these aromatics uh, and uh, aliphatic side chains. And with increasing rank, we lose these aliphatic side chains and becomes more aromatic. So then also, if we were to look at on a side chain, from the side, um, we can see kind of a random orientation of the molecules in a high volume of bituminous rank pole. And with the increase in rank, now these molecules are lining up parallel to bedding. And that's what gives us the anisotropy. So this is a photo micrograph of uh, vitronite clasp in a shale. This is that 500 times magnification. This up here would be the, uh, the mineral ground mass of the shale. The, Dark down here is the epoxy uh, binder of the pellet. And so this slide shows the importance of texture quality. So this part here is outside of the field. It's not, not polished, below the, the polished surface. There are some pits uh, here, some scratches, which would lower the reflectance if I were to measure on that. And then here's a, a nice area that's clean. And this would be the area that we would want to measure our vitronite reflectance. The precision uh, of the measurement itself is to 0.01%. If you ever see a measurement that's 0.001%, that's an error due to rounding, because we're taking a number of measurements and uh, taking an, the average value. And it should always be reported to 0.01%. This is a, a typical histogram. Uh, this is from uh, the Woodford Shale in the Arbuckle Mountains in southern Oklahoma. And I point out, so here the mean random reflectance, random refers now instead of maximum, where we can rotate the stage 360 degrees, random reflectance is where we uh, have a fixed stage, and it's just a random slice, basically, through the vitronite. And we do that because the class, the vitronite class in a shale are so small that we can't rotate the stage and stay in that, on that particle. Um, there are techniques now where we're rotating the polarizer instead of stage. But in this case, there were 75 measurements, and the range was 0.36 to 0.68%, or a range of about 0.3%. This is a very typical vitronic reflectance curve. It follows a nice normalized distribution and a, a range of around 0.3%. So one of the takeaways of this lecture is Vitronite reflectance value is based on a number of measurements. In this case, if we only had a few measurements, say here and here and here, we don't know where we are within that, uh, this histogram to know, you know, are we, if we only had a few down here or a few up here. So uh, you need a, a minimum of 20 measurements to fill in and up of this normalized distribution. Well, at, at, uh, higher ranks, this is now at 1.78% reflectance. Here I was able to measure maximum reflectance in a uh, coal strainer in the Woodford Shale. Um, and since I was able to measure maximum reflectance, the range of values was brought down. So we can see the range was 1.68 to 1.80%. So instead of the 0.3% spread, now the spread was only 0.2%. But anyways, and again, it follows this nice normalized distribution. Well, there are problems in obtaining true reflectance maturities. And again, this would be another whole hour lecture if I went through this in detail. But uh, I point out at the top, properly identified vitronite. So primary vitronite would be where the wood was deposited in mud, and that mud was buried and formed into a shale. Uh, recycled vitronite is where that shale was then uplifted, like in the Washita Mountains, and then eroded into the Arcoma Basin and redeposited in the Arcoma Basin now. It started out already as vitronite, but now it's in a new mud, so that's recycled. Paving contamination is, uh, if you've ever worked with well cuttings, you know anything below the pipe is coming up and sloughing off other rock that's coming up. So I'm going to show you an example of an extreme paving contamination that I deal with, which is again why we, I use the whole rock preparation, because I can identify this Caving contamination basis. 
from uh, the black shell that I'm looking at. Meta additives. A lot of times, uh, uh, petroleum engineers will add uh, like lignite to their, you know, drilling mud, and of course that's you know has vitronite in it or uh, humanite. So, and then we'll look at some subtypes of uh, reflectors. There's other factors that I won't go into detail, like weathering, this pitted, uh, dissolved uh, surfaces, um, natural coking. If you have an igneous dike that cuts through the rock. And then we'll look at too few readings. Then the next category was vitronite like organic matter. We'll look at these types vitronite subtypes, inert night masterals, grapholites, and solid vitrine. My favorite subject. So, vitronite subtypes within the same pole. This is a four micrograph of the same pole. Uh, this is a 500 times magnification. Here again, the vitronite, in this case, it's colodetronite, is the ground mass of these other masterals. Um, and you can see that this reflectance of this vitronite is lower than this reflectance over here. Well, this is thought to come from uh, the bark of the tree, the woody tissue from the, the bark, which was exposed to the outside and oxidized later. So this uh, vitronite retains the cell wall material, the woody tissue, and it also is very brittle. Uh, it has usually straighter boundaries than this type of vitronite. Um, this just shows in a coal, uh, this is taken at 200 times magnification. Now the field width is 320 microns. The vitronite is this gray material here. This higher reflected stuff, which still retains the woody tissue of the original wood, was slightly oxidized, so it has uh, a higher reflectance than the vitronite. And then this is fusonite, which is that charred wood at the time of heat deposition. So I can, I can say definitely that there was, there were swamp fires and charring back in the Devonian, back in the Pennsylvania, because I've seen it. Well, and there's graptolites. Well, this is what they look like um, in textbook, but what do they look like in reflected white light? <clears throat> so this is a, as an example. This was a study I did in 1991. Um, and uh, here, if, we, if you had given somebody a, a, an ordemission age rock, uh, black shale and crushed it to a, a powder, say, or near, nearly to a powder, and they looked, the organic petrologists looked at that, they would say that that is vitronate. I mean, it's got that same gray appearance. And in fact, I've, I've worked on ordemission age samples from the Washtenaw Mountains uh, that were, had fragments. In this paper, uh, we talked about different characteristics of, uh, that help us identify that this is a graphite, and one of them is this line separating these two different parts of the paradigm. <clears throat> um, since vitronite and graptolites don't occur in the same rock, there have been a number of studies over recent years that have tried to correlate graptolite reflectance to vitronite reflectance. And uh, it's kind of an, an indirect route, but for the most part, graptolite reflectance is fairly close to the uh, vitronite reflectance, so it can be used more as a qualitative thermal, thermal, thermal material indicator. So now we'll get to bitumen. Organic geochemists define bitumen as organic matter that's soluble in organic solvents. And there's a lot of different terms that have been used. Um, asphalt, asphaltite, asphaltic power bitumen, solid bitumen, solid hydrocarbon, micro bitumen. So I'll be uh, using the term solid bitumen in this presentation. So the importance of recognizing solid bitumen during the vitronite reflectance analysis is number one, bitumen can be mistaken as bitumen. And secondly, uh, if we can identify and measure the bitumen reflectance, we can use that value to calculate a vitronite reflectance equivalent. Well, Curiali in 1986 came up with this genetic classification of bitumen. What's the origin of this stuff? And he came up with pre-oil solid bitumen and post-oil solid bitumen. So the pre-oil solid bitumen is the early generation products of rich source rocks, probably, probably extruded from their source as a very viscous fluid and migrated the minimum distance necessary to reach fractures and voids of the rock. In the next slide, we'll look at uh, a hydrospirolysis study by Mike Lewin, where he demonstrated that kerogen uh, generates this bitumen, and the bitumen then uh, generates this oil. Well, there's also post oil solid bitumen. These are products of a once liquid crude oil generated and migrated from a conventional oil source rock and subsequently degraded. 
which includes these vein deposits. Uh, so this is the hydrosporolysis experiment from Mike Lewin shows with increasing temperature, you break down the keratin, generate this bitumen, which is bitumen generation, which would be the pre-oil bitumen. If you further break down this bitumen, then you generate oil, and then you go into this pyrobitumen phase or post-oil bitumen, solid bitumen phase. Lannis and Castaño were one of the first to measure the bitumen reflectance and bitronite reflectance from the same shale. And so they ended up with these two common pre-oil solid bitumen optical forms. And they developed a regression equation where you can predict what the bitronite reflectance equivalent is based on the measured bit bitumen reflectance. And they used this uh, homogeneous form uh, to base their equation on. Now, this homogeneous form can either be opaque, like down here, where, it, again, this texture looks very similar to bitronite to uh, semi-translucent, where you can actually see internal reflections from some pyrite below the surface. The other form would be the granular form, and that, of course, is uh, uh, it's actually fairly rare, and it's easily to identify that it's not bitumen. One of the things that got me interested in bitumen was uh, this uh, generic classification. These are fracture-filling post-oil solid bitumens. In Oklahoma, we have gramite, deposits in the Washita Mountains, and then imsonite. In fact, these solid hydrocarbon samples are what I gave Bob to, uh, to do the geochemistry on. And what's interesting to me, again, are the source of these different uh, asphaltites. The, uh, the asphaltites have uh, the, an asphaltine-rich asphalt, a paraffinic oil, or a naphthene-rich uh, oil. And then with increasing th alteration, thermal alteration, it forms these imsonites. Well, this is uh, from, a st uh, from uh, Utah. This is the Gilsonite vein deposit. This was the fracture where the, the bitumen was, uh, was found. And here are three guys standing above this vein um, before they extracted this Gilsonite. And this is what a hand sample of this stuff looks like. It's very light, and it has conchoidal fracture. Well, I did a study uh, published in 2015 on post-oil solid bitumen network in the Woodford Shale, a potential primary migration pathway. And I was noticing when I was working with these high thermal maturity shales that I saw a lot of these little speck stuff. So I uh, went to my colleague who runs the skinny electron microscope and said, let's look at this under the microscope. And we did this whole uh, previous study uh, looking at the, the, uh, where the nanoporosity uh, is in these, this organic matter. It turns out it's in this, uh, this uh, post-oil solid bitumen. So from, a, um, from the light microscope, I was able to identify a speckle, which are one to two microns in size, verified by the SEM, wispy, which are two to five microns in size, and then connected, anything greater than five microns. So uh, this is the Lannis and Castaño equation, where again, they measured uh, the solid bitumen uh, reflectance and the bitumen reflectance came up with a nice regression equation. And I use this equation from 1996, uh, almost to the recent. And then a couple other papers came along, and they uh, also came up with their own equations. Um, and then uh, I published, uh, la at the end of last year, I published uh, Circular 152 on uh, the Woodford Shale. Uh, it's Oklahoma Geological Survey Bulletin 152. And so I, had, I ended up with 210 pairs of uh, bitumen reflectance measurements. And so this is my regression equation. And then comparing it to other equations, this is the red line here is mine. This dashed line is the one-to-one -one line. And, you can, and other equations are buried uh, under my line. You can see that the bitumen reflectance is slightly higher than the bitumen reflectance. Uh, and gets the, the bitumen reflectance gets closer and closer to that bitumen reflectance as you go into very high thermal maturity. The, the oddball here was uh, a, a, a publication, a regression equation by Jakob. Now, Jakob is the one that measured the bitumen reflectance in the country rock adjacent to these, um, these fracture filling vein deposits, which, which crossed a, across a lot of different strata. So, this is the anomaly. Uh, and 
all the other equations follow uh, the one that I have as well. And as, as a comparison, I take uh, a bitumen reflectance of say 0.3% and put it through the couple of these other equations. Landis Castaño predicted a bitumen reflectance equivalent of 0.65, shown here, 0.52, and mine falls right in between there, 0.57. And that pretty much uh, continued all the way up. So the, the difference between um, bitumen reflectance and bitumen reflectance, bitumen generally has a reflectance around 0.2 to 0.3% uh, lower than vitronite reflectance. Well, vitronite like bitumen is the greatest source of error for low film maturity shales and probably the source of what's referred to as reflectance suppression. Hackley and others in 2013 concluded that vitronite reflectance measurements of early matured Devonian shales in the Appalachian Basin may erroneously include pre oil solid bitumen reflectance measurements. So the recommendation is use these whole rock pellets where we can better identify the bitumen related to the, um, the, the bitumen. Well, now I'll quickly go through some sources of error, looking at samples and equipment. And we'll go through sample type, lithology, sample handling, and organic matter. So sample type depends on if it's core, outcrop, or cuttings. Well, core is always going to be the best. Uh, outcrop, you have to deal with weathering, and we'll see the impacts of that. Uh, and then well cuttings, you have that problem of caving contamination. All of these uh, types of samples, we deal with th that recycled vitronite, and all of them have to deal with vitronite like organic matter. So this is a, an actual sample that I received uh, in the lab. I was looking at this black shale, and this is what I got, all of this uh, like woody stuff that was uh, drilling mud out of here. This is again an actual sample, a typical sample that I would receive in the lab from well cuttings from an oil company. And again, I was looking at the black shales, but you can see there are a lot of these grays and, uh, and yellow. And even when I went down and I hand picked out just the black shale cuttings and made my, my uh, pellets, most of the time there was a lot of caving contamination based even on those black shales. So I could tell this isn't a wood for lithology compared to what I knew. So. And then oil-based drilling mud. This is a, a major problem. A lot of the, especially deeper wells, use an oil-based drilling mud, which doesn't affect the uh, doesn't affect the petrography. It affects the geochemistry. So I had a study done uh, where uh, we had a core with uh, that used an oil-based drilling mud, threw the whole chemistry off, but uh, I could actually analyze it. So this is after the samples, the well cuttings were washed in Dawn dishwashing liquid. I highly recommend Dawn. It's, uh, that took the oil out. I always thought it'd be a great spokesperson. You know, I could say, hey, this stuff works. It's oil-based drilling mud. Uh, this is a study from Bostic, 1979, that shows a number of these histograms down a well. The vitronite would represent this uh, curve here. Notice that the bitumen has a lower reflectance than vitronite. And the, the caving contamination also, since it's uphole, also has a lower thermal maturity. This is a... a an example, this is a study I did uh, with Lowen and Carta in 1994 on uh, weathering in both coal and shale. And we could point out that we ended up with this tarnishing along fractures and these random fractures that ended up uh, emanating out. And of course, the tarnishing lowers the reflectance. Um, this was a study I did in 1994. Uh, this is in a, a shale from the Washita Mountains in Southeast Oklahoma. And again, we can see this tarnishing along the edges of the particle and these random fractures that cut into the shell particle, the vitronite particle. The next is uh, lithology, whether it's a sample of coal, shale, siltstone, or sandstone. Bostick and Foster showed that we always want to have coal as the benchmark. If there's a coal in this section, that's the best sample to work with. Sandstone is the worst because uh, you can think of uh, its porosity, any fluids that migrate through the rock are gonna oxidize any vitronite in there and change it. And then uh, in this study, they used argillites or, or shales, and that was more consistent. And again, which is what I used my whole career, the uh, vitro uh, vitronite reflectance of the Woodford shale, a, uh, a silica rich shale. And then sample handling depends on whether we have an oil-based drilling mud, um, Kerogen isolation. So, palynologists use to 
digest the mineral matter as well, but they'll use nitric acid. Well, nitric acid will oxidize the sample. So we don't want to use the same preparation that the pollenologists use. Uh, we don't want to oxidize the sample. We don't want to heat the sample at all uh, as well. And then finally, organic matter, which is summarized in this slide. So quantity, we need a minimum of 20 measurements. So Barker and Pavlovich in 1993 demonstrated you need a minimum of 20 measurements to fill in enough of that normalized distribution to give you a good uh, a, uh, distribution anyway. So quality, you don't, you want to avoid that pitted uh, vitronite. Size should be larger than the measuring spot. The measuring spot now is defined as about five microns in size, so it should be larger than five microns. My measuring spot on the microscope I had, which was older, was ten, uh, the measuring spot was eight microns. So I needed a larger particle, which took me longer time to uh, find uh, enough measurements. Um, type. So again, we talked about vitronate like organic matter. So it's important to uh, recognize that. Thermal maturity. Um, with increasing thermal maturity, you have this problem with anisotropy. And uh, so the spread of values from a random reflectance will be uh, wider as we increase in rank. So the highest uh, vitro reflex I ever measured was 6.36%. And it had values from like 3% up to like 8%, wide range of values. But this is like meta anthracite rank, very high uh, thermal maturity. And then reflected suppression, uh, which uh, again would take a, a long time for uh, me to try and explain and it's complicated. So. This was a, that same 1994 study where I measured everything and then interpreted it as I go along. So even though I don't use it, I still take measurements on that pitted reflectance. And that's what these values are down here, either bitumen or degraded vitronite. And then I knew that this was a good piece of vitronite. This one was pitted. So this started my essentially 0.3% range that I was expecting. And then these values up here uh, were either um, it's recycled vitronite, which was uh, very common in these uh, these uh, Washita Mountain samples uh, due to uplift, um, or they were inert night masters. But again, we can see this nice normalized distribution in the uh, vitronite part of the field. So summary of how to tell good data from bad data. Number one is the number of measurements. Again, our, our goal is to get 20 measurements. If it's less than that, the vitronite reflectance value is considered more of a qualitative thermal maturity indicator rather than a quantitative thermal indicator. The shape of the histogram, so it's nice to have that histogram so you can see what the shape is. Sometimes it's uh, skewed one side or the other. Um, and then you can also see the uh, range of the values. And then photomicrographs really help to see the quality and the size of the class, any surrounding minerals, um, and then that it's a correct identification of the primary vitronite. This is an actual published paper, East 1980-something. And um, this was a core sample. So we knew we didn't have a contamination problem. Um, and if, I, if, you only, if you only provided that the mean value is 1.18%, and from 110 measurements, you'd say, that's great. I believe that. But since it provided the, the histogram, and showed that the range was 0.41 to 2.15%. Just what I've told you today, you'd say, that's got to be wrong, OK? And that's what I said. And so down here, this is what I would have interpreted the vitro reflectance to be. Uh, and then all of this is that um, inert night masterals, which were more common in this sample than the vitro. Uh, if a uh, summary of equipment. The polishing equipment is very important. Um, we want a relief-free, scratch-free surface. And so even though it's, it's not as difficult uh, as it would be to get a thin section of coal, it's still kind of an art form to, to polish the, the pellets and get it where it doesn't have a lot of scratches or pits in it. The glass standard for calibration should have a range. I use two glass standards to uh, calibrate my microscope. Uh, immersion oil contamination, before I put the objective, the, uh, the glass standard back on, I'd wipe the immersion oil off the objective so I wasn't contaminating it from the rock to back to my glass standard. And air bubbles will happen when uh, the immersion oil now drops, soaks into uh, any pores in that pellet and air comes out and it, the 
air, the air bubbles always migrate to the edge of the objective and it'll throw a, a shadow on the field of view. So you uh, have to be aware of that during the analysis as well. And then lastly, it's the, the quality of the optics. Um, I worked on a microscope that was 40 years old, bought in 1980, and it was the old photomultiplier system. And I have to, when I get to work in the morning, I turn it on, wait an hour for it to warm up. Then I would calibrate the microscope, run about five measurements, check the calibration, run another five measurements on a cold, check the calibration. It had to be checked every 15 to 30 minutes. And by the afternoon, I could go for a whole hour without checking and retweaking the calibration. Well, now the new microscope photometer systems use essentially digital cameras. And you can turn it on, calibrate the system, and run the day. Um, so it's not as, as a problem. So we don't have this frequency of calibration problem that I used to have. So in summary, what is vitronite? You should all be able to answer it's a coal mass rule derived from wood. That's number one, okay? Vitronite reflectance is a measurement of the percentage of light reflected from the vitronite mass rule, and it's an average of many measurements. So when you have a vitronite reflectance value, it's not, it's not just one value, it's a number of measurements. So um, I wanted to uh, give a, a very quick application of vitronite reflectance to a gas shale. So uh, Jarvie, my friend Dan Jarvie in 2012, uh, said the thermal maturity values from about 0.60 to 1.40% are the most likely values significant for petroleum liquid generation. Regardless of thermal maturity, there must be sufficient oil saturation to allow the possibility, possibility of commercial production of oil. So I'm a, I'll say I'm a boundary guy. So when gas shales first came out, we said it had to be up in the gas window as you got closer to the oil window, oh, the oil must plug up the permeability and stop the flow of you know, gas out of the shale. So I was always interested, well, what boundary is it? How low can I go and still get something? And then we started seeing these uh, liquid hydrocarbons produced from, from uh, these shales. And oh, okay, so in, in the, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, they made a mistake. They got into a rock that was you know, in the oil window or condensate window and uh, they happened to produce a little bit of liquids, but they got lucky, okay? Well, then it came back lower and lower. And then I had a colleague that uh, drilled a well uh, where I measured 0.58%. And so the, he was trying to emphasize that, yeah, that's gonna be an oil producer. And I said, no, it's too close to the start of the oil window. You didn't have enough oil saturation to, uh, to, to start primary oil migration in the rock. So generally we need it, around 0.6% uh, to start generating oil. And 0.9% uh, would be the peak of the oil window. And uh, so now most of the liquid hydrocarbon shell plays uh, are up in the upper part of the oil window to the lower part in the condensate window. Uh, so about 0.9 to 1.3%, 1.2% reflectance. Uh, Jarvie in um, 2005, <clears throat> provided these guidelines for the Barnett Shale um, based on rock and bell paralysis. So the oil windows from 0.55 to 1.15% with a peak of 0.9%, condensate window from 1.15 to 1.4%, and a dry gas or methane window greater than 1.4%. So um, I, uh, I've used this boundary for uh, my career working in the Whitford Shale just to see how good is this. And so this uh, again, came from the uh, Bulletin 152 from last year. And this shows uh, a summary of my vitron reflectance data. So these are isoreflectance contours based on uh, 350 samples of uh, Woodford shale samples. And then these are the uh, Woodford shale only wells. And the black here, black circles, are where they produce only methane, no liquids as well. And you can see the boundary is somewhere around 1.5 to 1.4 percent. So anything above that, 1.4, 1.5 percent Anything higher than that, you'll only expect methane and not uh, any liquids. So then this slide, uh, I wanted to see where's the boundary between an oil and a condensate, and I used 49 uh, degree uh, gravity API gravity oil as the boundary. So. Anything less than 49 would be an oil, which would be these yellow stars. And then the condensate 
uh, would be these purple diamonds. And again, it follows really closely to at least what my prediction was that the, uh, the boundary is around 1.15% to try flexions up to about 1.5%. So for, uh, if you want, if you're really interested in the topic and want to, and, and you have a, a lot of time in your hands to do some reading, go to the TSOP website, tsop.org. And down here in the, in the bottom, it shows the references. And then you can see all these references. So um, these are references that I put on these bibliographies. There's 44 different topics here, including bitumen reflectance, electron microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, gas shales, uh, shell liquids, uh, internet, so class reflectance and vitronite reflectance. So uh, again, these were, uh, uh, I, I told them a year before I retired that I was going to stop doing this, uh, trying to keep up with the literature. And so the last time I updated this was April of last year, 2021, so a year ago. So for that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, we have, uh, we've got two minutes for questions. So <laughs> get it in there. Brian, uh, I, I've got a question. Your... Well, so if anybody does have to leave, uh, you know, I won't be offended. Uh, I know it's late, getting late. I ran, uh, I've got, you know, I have a lot of slides to go through, but yeah, I'll entertain Bob play. first. Yeah. Uh, Finkelstein, is that right? In the definition of Maseril, it said you find these in sedimentary rocks and igneous metamorphic rocks. How do you... How, have you seen and Okay, so that was Bill Spackman. Yeah. Spackman was like the father of organic right. control. The father of coal patrol, y'all say. I know, you don't argue with Bill. For Penn State, okay? So if that's what he said in 1958, then you're right. It's really sedimentary rocks. I haven't seen any. It depends on your definition of metamorphic. So really, coals and shells are low metamorphic, very, very low metamorphic rocks. But yeah, igneous, uh, I don't know that I've ever found it in an igneous rock. There was an example where a magma uh, covered a, a forest and there were uh, preserved um, trees in the basalt. That is really. Yeah. Well, so there you go. Yeah. Bill Spackman was correct then. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. So, yeah, there are many different types of thermal maturity indicators, like appetite fission track and, uh, you know, clonidine alteration index and things from. So, um, a lot of these techniques are, uh, some of them are more qualitative, like the clonidine alteration. And, uh, and some of the palynological studies and the changes in colors of the, the polynomorphs and things like that. And what I didn't have time to show you is the fluorescence. Fluorescence is one of those things we can use as well. Uh, in fact, uh, quantitative fluorescence is to actually get the fluorescence spectra of a particular lithonite mass rule, like uh, an algae or a spore. And for my master's thesis, that's what I did. Um, but then qualitative 